Mr. Terrell, how are we doing today, boss? I am amazing, man. Thanks for asking. Ah, uh, you know, you just got to, you know, start the conversation off with a high note, you know. Usually if you wake up and breathe, it's a good day, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I try to keep that mindset every day. Oh, yeah. Putting things in perspective. I remember one of my old like baseball academies, you know, everyone has like a bad day hitting or something or pitching can't hit a target. And they had like this big poster up on the wall. And it was like of all these news articles that were just like awful things. And he went after like your session or whatever. You go, yo, look at that picture or look at the look at the poster. It's not it's not that bad. So that's how I kind of, you know, got that got that vibe. So if you put things in perspective, it's never really that bad. Right. No, I, I completely. That's an interesting approach right there, though. Yeah, you know, we're, it, at least you're not that bad. Like, hey, man, that's why I say like, you wake up and breathe in the morning. You're lucky. Not everyone can do that. So, all right, let's let, let's get away from the, uh, the, you know, the what am I saying? The deep, the very deep conversation that we're going into. And, you know, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about you, Terrell. So, Terrell, so you're a, you, you got your own accounting firm before before we go into all that. I mean, that's unbelievable to start so where did you start in the finance and accounting world so i started back when i was in college so um i actually you know what back when i was in high school um in like i graduated what high school in like 2003 and back then i my school was testing out this new thing of called the academy of finance and where they were going to allow high school students to take very basic level, you know, accounting and finance classes. So I started taking them. And then I also got an internship working at a bank while I was in high school. And most of the other classes in high school, I really, I mean, I did it to stay out of trouble so I could stay on the football team. Um, but I really wasn't excited about any of them. But when I started taking the Academy of Finance class, I'm like, you know, I didn't actually like this stuff. So I decided once I went to college is to major in um, finance and accounting. And, you know, a lot of people either went a general business, but I figured, hey, I got to be able to find a job when I'm done. So let me go a little bit more than general business. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. That's like that's like a huge thing. I feel like a bunch of people in high school. That's a, that's a thing that they, they say, like, they you know, their freshman year of college, like, oh, I'm, you know, I just want to be a business major. Yeah. And then, and then they don't know. And then they go, you know join a frat and they're like, yeah, I, I'm more into this more than, uh, more than the school. So yeah, no, but that's awesome. It's awesome that you were able to find like a passion for something at an early age. Cause a lot of people aren't able to do that right away, especially in high school, man. Like that's, that's really early compared to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, and, and it really paid a lot of benefits because like I said, for me, it was, there were other things that were other classes or different programs that I got involved with. It's just nothing really stuck. And to be completely honest, at the time, I didn't know if I'm like, hey, you know what, this is like my thing. I'm going to do it forever. It's just like, hey, there's some, I actually like this more than the other things that I'm doing. I don't know if I'm going to do it forever, but I like it more than the other options. So let me see where this goes. And so that's kind of how I just continue to travel down that road. And once I got to college and um, I started talking to a couple of the, the upperclassmen in college that had graduated. And, and that was kind of what I realized early on. My kind of my freshman year, there were some people who had majored in business and I was talking to them. How was it finding a job afterwards? And they were kind of like, ah, it's pretty tough. I wish I would have, you know, focused on accounting or I wish I would have focused on specifically on marketing. And when I heard that over and over and I'm like, okay, all right, I need to pick a focus because I want to find a job afterwards. And so for me, it was just kind of this trail of, hey, I actually resonate with this more than others. I don't know if I want to do it forever, but there's something about it I want to figure out. Yeah, you're, kind of, you're, you're drawn to it. And it doesn't feel like, I'm sure there's some days because it happens with everyone. You know, <laughs> I, I hate this, man. I don't want to do these long equations in you know, my accounting class that, oh, they won't help me later in life or well, whatever it may be. And it, but everyone has their say. But at the end, you still were, you know, having fun with what you were doing and not thinking of it so much as I have to do this work rather than, yeah, I, I'm going to do this work because it'll help me out one day, which is, Awesome to figure out. So after graduating college, what was your like first job in finance? Yeah. So my first job was actually as a auditor. So I went to work for a public accounting firm and 
my job was pretty much to go in and, and, and test and dig through all their financial records and tell them if they were doing their accounting correct or incorrect. Um, now, of course, it wasn't just me. It was, I was a, a team of people. But for me, you know, it gave me a chance um, because I looked at a couple of options. Like one option, I could have went and worked directly as like an accountant for a specific company. But when I looked at the options and said, okay, even at graduation, I still don't know what I want to do yet. I know it's something in business. So being an auditor was like, hey, I'll get a chance to get an inside look at a bunch of different companies. And then I'm like, you know, what other job would allow a young 20 something year old kid to go sit down and have conversations with executives about how they're running their business? So I'm just like, hey, auditors seem like a good fit. So, you know, I went to be an auditor and um, did that for a few years now. A lot about the auditing experience, I was like, yeah, I won't be doing this long because I did not like it. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's interesting that you say it because I remember reading like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Robert Kiyosaki did like all these different jobs. Like worked in an accounting firm, worked as a sales rep, and he didn't do it because he knew that's what he wanted to do. Like he didn't want to be a sales rep. He wanted to learn these things so one day he could put them all together. And it was, it's awesome, Kyle, like you know, there's kind of parallels between that, between that and you because you were able to you know, I don't want to be an auditor. I don't like, I don't like, you know, going through someone else, but it gave you the, in, like you were saying, the inside look of what a business is actually like. So now, you know, now that you have your own, I'm, pro I'm sure that you learned a lot from those like beginning days that you still hold with you now. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I tell people is it's probably the thing that most accountants who go into public accounting, absolutely hate doing like walkthroughs and they call them walkthroughs and internal controls and pretty much what you're doing is you are looking at a, a a transact something that the business did and you're walking it from you know when they made the decision to how it actually shows up on the financial statements and some of these walkthroughs it may take you like a whole day to kind of map it out to see okay what are all the decisions that were made and a lot of people hate it doing it um, but it's probably the biggest thing that has helped me even, you know, do well in my own firm now, because like, I know how to understand, go from a decision to how it's going to show up on the financial statements. And that's exactly what my clients hire me for. Like, Hey, if we do this, what is it going to look like? And since I spent years studying that process of learning that skill, like I can do that all day long. Yeah. And now you have the mental capacity to sit at your desk, you know, maybe you get some coffee involved there too, or, you know, a little energy <laughs> drink so you can look at those numbers a little bit longer, but yeah, like, yeah, you, you go, you keep doing the same thing. You're going to get better at it, whatever, whatever it may be. I think I, I say that in probably every podcast that I do, you know, the more repetitions, repetitions, the more repetitions you have a higher chance of succeeding. Well, what, what's the saying? Like time plus effort equals success or something in that manner. So I'm sure that you tried your best whenever you were doing these, you know, things that you didn't really know when you really didn't know when you wanted to do. But like you're saying now, like now I'm, you know, I use these things in my firm nowadays rather than, you know, what I was doing then when I thought it was like, oh man, I really don't want to do this. But it's awesome that it kind of comes full circle. And I feel like that happens to a lot of people and whatever they do that, you know, the things that they do back then that they say they hate or, you know, they didn't like, it comes full circle. I'm like, wow, I'm glad that I got through that because this actually helped me a lot. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, cause it's something that helped me even along the way. Like when I worked in public accounting and after I left that, I worked for, you know, I worked for, you know, two fortune 500 companies throughout my career. Um, I had the opportunity to move down to Brazil to work in Brazil for a year. And it happened to be the year the world cup was in Brazil. So that made it even better. Um, but one of the big things that, you know, that opened up a lot of those opportunities for me is I go back to like those narratives and walkthroughs is that I could listen to a potential decision that's being discussed and I can think through, okay, if they do that, then this happens, this happens, this happens. Okay. This is how it's going to look on the financials. And when I could tell like the leadership team or the management team, even when I was a young professional, I can say, Hey, well, if you do that, here's what that's going to look like. When I was able to do that, it's like, they're like, hey, we need to keep that kid around. And so they just kept moving me up and allowing me to go an opportunity. And like I said, it came from doing that thing that a lot of accountants hated doing in public accounting. 
Yeah, I, I love the, you know, the, the whole thing about like people hating something or not wanting to do it. I think that's what really makes people more driven and whatever they want. Because if you hate it, like to me, at least when I hate something, like I want to get through it, especially with college classes. Like that's a big thing for college kids. Like they hate taking these, <laughs> you know, classes that they're like, I, I could care less about, like, I don't want to do this on my Tuesday afternoon, I'd rather be, you know, I, I whatever college kids do. I don't know, but y- you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, yeah, like it, but those are the things that can teach you more about not only yourself, but more about the profession in general, because I'm sure like when you were in college, you had to take marketing classes, not just finance, not just accounting. And I'm sure that at the time you're like, why am I doing, why am I doing this? I'm going to be a finance major. Like I'm going to go in the world, the accounting world. But when you looked at these guys and these big companies, I'm trying to, you know, put this all together. When you look at these big companies and when you're saying like, when you make this decision, how's it going to affect it? I'm sure that those classes, just having like the slightest knowledge about it helped in those sense, because now, you know, now, you know what you're talking about. Now, you know how to interact with these different departments and say, Hey, maybe you're advertising. If you spent this much money, this is what it's going to look like. If you took this other route, maybe you could, maybe we could save some money here or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, because even when I think about in, in college, a class that I took that, well, two classes that I took that a lot of people did not like. Um, one was it was a Old Testament religion class. Um, and I did not go to like a, 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 uh, a religious school. It was a liberal arts school. It was just, that was one of the literature options and a philosophy, like a general philosophy class. And in both of those classes, I mean, there were the whole premise behind a lot of the things we were doing in both of those classes was asking questions about things people already felt like they had the answer to. And just being able to develop that skill set of, hey, don't buy into your own ideas, but ask questions and investigate. And I will say that that single principle has been something that has impacted every aspect of how I run my business now. And even just when I was working and moving through my career, it's just, hey, you know, the sales team said that, you know, they can't, you know, they can't close these deals. And my thought was, okay, don't accept everything as is, just ask questions and start to understand. And when I started asking questions, what I was able to do is to help them figure out how to get creative about the way they structured the contracts to where we were able to close more deals to the point where that allowed me to get more promotion. So I completely agree. Like all those things that didn't fit directly in my field, they played a way somehow when I stopped fighting against it and just was like, Hey, let me get through this and get the value. And then one day I'll use it. I don't know when, but I'll use it at some point. The outside of the box thinking for most people is very limited. You know, your whole life, (laughs) my opinion on school in general is, you know, you do the same thing every day and it's routine and you're really learning like passively, you know, they tell you what you should study, you study it, and then it goes out of your mind the next day. And you do this over and over and over and over again. And eventually, you know, you learn how to take a test, you learn how to study for an exam or whatever it may be. But I like what you're saying about this outside of the box thinking. It's like a different form of creativity that you don't really classify as creativity. I think a lot of people think it's like art or whatever it is, or, you know, drawing a picture, but creativity can come in so many different ways. In your form, you know, how am I going to solve this problem in a different way? And that's where, that's where successful people become successful because, you know, I like the example. And it's going to sound funny. Of the, you know what the scrub daddy sponge is? No. So basically, it's a better sponge. And <laughs> I, I, I was like, what this guy's like? I can't imagine that. And you know, whoever the guy that came up with was like, he probably looked at a sponge like, how can I make this better? Like, <laughs> like what? Where's the problem here? And like, he was able to figure out. You know, made a whole different material patent patented out the wazoo so you know and trademarked it so you know no one could else st- no one else could steal the idea but like that's kind of where it goes into playing coming back to like what you're saying it's able to think outside the box in these ways 
that you're not accustomed to so much or as society deems like creative or outside the box thinking that everyone kind of is hmm is taught to say I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly but they're taught to have this basic idea of what creativity and outside the box thinking is but until you can apply it in a different direction that's when it kind of people realize like wow this is actually a skill that I haven't used before and I thought it was something else my entire life no I completely agree I mean and I think we I've come face to face with that a lot and one of the things that I notice is that the people who get used to thinking outside of the box. Like you said, those are the people who tend to rise to the top a little bit more and a little bit faster or sometimes a lot faster than others. To where I, I do think you run into that a lot with, in my field, like with accounting. I mean, a lot of accountants are very, hey, here's my pretty little box. I need to stay in this box and I don't do anything that doesn't that doesn't already fit in the box. And they don't change until someone else comes and says, hey, after meeting and meeting and committee meeting, the rules have now been adjusted. Okay, now I can fit this new thing in here, but there's still a new boundary and I got to stay in this box. And I will say there's a place for that. But when it comes down to like growing a business, especially if someone that wants to start a business, I mean, it's not going to be a, a mentality that will help you a lot. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. You have to be able to think freely. You can't do what someone's always telling you to do your entire life. It if hey, you can do that. You can a hundred percent do it if you like being complacent. But you know, most people don't like being stagnant so much unless you're you know that small you know five percent or whatever it is. I don't, there's probably some statistic out there nowadays that can tell you that but you can look that up on your own time but yeah you have to be able to think in a different way that wasn't really taught to you in school except you have to dig a little bit deeper yourself and figure it out because there's no class that's going to be that just straight up says how to be creative there's nothing like that no one's going to tell you it's not in any textbook or whatever it is it's something that you need to find internally like you were saying come back to like you know, saying in your class like I took a philosophy class it I didn't I wasn't learning so much about you know why a tree falls in the forest doesn't make a sound and writing an essay on it and like at the end of the day you probably you know remember writing that essay and don't even remember what it was about but it, in turn like basically it taught you a different message that you didn't think you didn't know that you already had like I'm sure that you were really creative and an outside the box thinker, but didn't realize it until like you were saying, the teacher told me to like this message and it stuck with me. And now I kind of like think about how to solve a problem in a different way, which I didn't before. Mm -hmm. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, cause I, I remember a specific example in business was um, I was a finance leader for, for this business in the aviation division. And so our job, we, you know, we, we repaired, um, propellers for military airplanes, wow. um, and exciting thing, great opportunity. And we, we were in the middle of like negotiating like a, a $20 million contract. And we were probably maybe like less than a month away from signing, they wanted to buy X number of propellers. And then there was a certain number they wanted us to be able to repair. And I was supposed to fly over to Europe to visit one of our major suppliers. And I remember like Monday morning waking up and I got a call from uh, the team over in Europe and they were like, hey, I think you'll need to cancel your trip. And I'm like, okay, um, is everything okay? And they were like, well, last night we had a devastating fire that burned everything to the ground. And so at first, I'm just like, well, first, is everyone OK? Um, they were like, yeah, it happened, you know, in the middle of the night. No one was there. Everyone's OK. Um, physically, people are really having a challenge emotionally. And I was like, I can completely understand that. And then the next thing is, why are a month away from signing this contract? So if I can't get my materials from you guys, I can't deliver to the military. So it was like, how are we going to figure this thing out? And I think, you know, we had to start working with the sales team, getting creative. And we were like, well, if we can't make new, new blades to give them, like they're expecting new blades. So what we ended up doing creatively is 
hey, we sold some extra blades to other customers in the in last year. They don't still need them. What if we go back and rebuy those from them, upgrade them, and then sell them to the military? And we'll just give them an IOU for, hey, when things get back up and running. And that creative strategy allowed us to secure the $22 million contract plus keep customers happy. And it was just one of those things where it's like, no in the box thinking would have allowed us to come up with a solution like that. Yeah, that and that first of all, that's absolutely wild. <laughs> that's wild, man. <laughs> but I, yeah, like you were saying, that like something bad happened. And I don't always, I, I think not, I think in today's world, like the entrepreneurship mindset kind of tells people like you just need to be committed to one thing and one thing only. Well, in the real world, that's just not true because, you know, situations just like that, you always, though the backup plan might not be that present or, you know, relative in your mind when you're doing this, you have to figure out a different way to approach it. You know, like you were saying, factory calling fire, we couldn't get propellers from Europe, something that, you know, happened literally in the snap of the fingers and, you know, it didn't happen. Like we weren't able to get from that supplier but you're able to think in a different way you didn't say like oh dang like now i guess we're not making this 20 million dollars like <laughs> obviously not like let's try and figure out how we can still do this and you figured it out though it wasn't the way you intended to it was a way that still got the job done absolutely <laughs> you know that's the whole that's like the whole phrase um keep on keeping on it's like if you were mining for gold you know and you didn't find any like that one day, are you going to stop or are you going to keep going? You could literally be like inches away from finding like a diamond or gold or whatever, you know, valuable mineral it is. And like tying that back in, like you could have stopped right then and there. Like when things hit the fan, that's what most people do. They're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And, you know, they get emotional, they get upset or whatever it may be. And then you know, it, it all turns off and they're like, oh, let me try something like, let me, I guess we're not doing this. Let me call, you know, make a call, tell them I'm, they're disappointed in me or whatever it is. <laughs> and you're able, you know, but it, you know, the long story short, you're able to get the job done. So Carl, something else I want to ask you is I'm sure as like a high schooler and things like that, you're getting educated about money and personal finance. Like I'm sure when you were, you know, 18, 20, you were able to at least have a decent idea of how to do your taxes and everything. So this is the question that I want to propose to you. Do you think colleges and schools and high schools should have more classes in that category of personal finance? Most certainly. I, I absolutely do because, you know, from firsthand and I guess you say, knowledge of seeing other people. There are so many people that I know that got into a bad financial situation back in college. I mean, even when it came down to like with refund checks and student loans where, I mean, every semester there would be some people that would show up with a, with a, a new used car. And it's just like, where did you get the money from that? Oh, I use my refund check or whatever. And it's just like, you do realize you're gonna have to pay that back at some point. And now, you know, several years, like, you know, like 13 plus years later, some of those people that were doing that, they're still trying to pay off those student loans to where I'm just like, somebody should have probably told them about this, like before they made that decision. So yeah, I, I definitely think there should be a whole lot more. I mean, from the area of just basic budgeting, um, just how taxes work, period. Um, and just, you know, like I said, being able to do your own taxes, even if they don't want to do them themselves, at least so they'll understand it. And then I think some basic understanding on, you know, like, you know, debt and debt management. Or, and then also, I think, you know, just basic understanding of, how money works in investing because there's so many people I know now that are kind of in their late thirties or their forties. And they're like, Hey, I want to start investing now. And it's like, this would have been completely different for you if you would have started in your twenties. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And like a bunch of my friends, like, I, like, you know, I am not a financial advisor, but I go, <laughs> you know, man, like maybe you should like put some money in the stock market. It's like, no, it's we're going to buy a 70 inch TV. It'll be sick in the room. Like, you know, the gamble on sports, two different screens. I'm like, come on guys. Like 
And they're like, you don't have enough money to invest, but you have enough money to buy that. Oh, yeah, I'll save up for it. Well, I'm like, that if you start investing, like, if, like, it doesn't take a lot of money to invest. And I think that's a huge misconception for a lot of people that you need thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to start getting in the stock market. That's completely and utterly false. You could start with a dollar. You know, you're not going to find yeah. many stocks for a dollar, but you can still start. And if you put, you know, a dollar in your, you know, e-trade fidelity whatever it may be your trading account over the next 10 years after every weekly paycheck that you get that builds up like there's a there's a huge saying that you know not from rich dad poor dad but it's just from every in every millionaire there is i don't work for my money my money works for me and people are like what does that even mean well i can sleep and have money in the stock market and i don't even need to touch it and it's literally making me money. Yeah. I mean, and I think that also one of those side benefits that come from investing in the stock market is it starts, it forces you to start paying attention to things that you would have never thought about before. I mean, because I always tell people, you know, even if you don't have a ton of money um, to, to invest, I mean, or, or they say, hey, I want to get into investing, but I don't have a ton of money. And I'm like, you know, start with, $10 or $5, because I guarantee if you put that five or that $10 in any stock, you are going to pay attention to what's going on financially more than you ever have, because you want to know what's going on with my $5, what's going on with my $10. And I think just by paying attention, you'll start to train yourself to see opportunities that you just wouldn't have seen had you not gotten involved in just paying attention. Oh, exactly. And it's not like, you know, making a decent amount of money in the stock market. Like, I uh, look at Warren Buffett. He didn't start off with, you know, making what, what's his net worth, like 100, 200 billion dollars, <laughs> whatever. It's some crazy, some crazy number. It takes a while. And in today's society, you know, the Gen Z culture loves instant gratification, loves <laughs> instant gratification. Get rich quick, blow up on TikTok, you know, going viral is like a big thing. And that's the same thing with making money. And that's why people are drawn to like gambling and things like that, because, you know, I can make, I can make another 20 bucks in three seconds on the roulette wheel or, or lose it all. <laughs> but, you know, go, going to say that I also think that people have a fear of losing money in the stock market. And my friends are like, well, I like my, like my dad's cousin's neighbor's dog, like, like just, you know, <laughs> lost three thousand dollars in the stock market and you didn't have anything the thing is you don't lose money in the stock market or investments until you sell yeah literally you're not going to lose any money it could hey no one knows what the stock market especially nowadays <laughs> no one can predict what's going to happen in the next day in the stock market but there's a chance of it going up there's a chance of it going down it's honestly pretty even like when covid happened you know, a lot of people got made a lot of money just from doing basic investments. People start with a hundred dollars and turned it to a thousand literally within a month because the market was so down. And then, mm. you know, what's going to happen? Like, you think the economy is going to fall off forever? Absolutely not. Like, come on. And people were, you know, emotional sellers, they sold everything, you know, like, uh, and, you know, that could be for other reasons too. I'm not trying to, you know, be very, you know, straight lined with this, with this saying, I'm trying to get both sides of, you know, the yin yang in, but what, you know, in, in conclusion, wow, that was, I, that was a very, this is a very long winded answer for this, but, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day that, you know, I think more people should be involved in the stock market because it sets up that future that you don't really think about now. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah I mean, I think it does. I mean, it, it sets it up for the future, uh, what you don't think about now. And I also think you said some of the side benefits is you start to understand your real relationship with money because I always tell oh, people, yeah. whenever you get ready to invest, what you're about to find out is you're about to find a whole new emotional side of yourself <laughs> that you didn't know existed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> exactly oh my god it's it's dead on you'll lose like a hundred dollars one you'll make like a two hundred dollars one day you lose a thousand like oh my god my heart but that's just i mean that's part of it that is part of it at the end of the day absolutely and it's like you know there have been some people that i've met that have like 
oh, I don't really care about money that much. It's like, okay, well, let's invest, you know, $50. And that $50 went to 55 and they were just the most excited person. I was like, I thought you didn't care about money that much. <laughs> but they're like, well, it's different. And I'm like, yeah, we all have a, there's this emotional attachment we have to money. Some of us have a, a, a stronger attachment and some of us have a looser attachment. But I always tell people is, you want to find out what that emotional attachment looks like for you, because what you don't realize, and, and I, I, I learned this from talking with some neuroscientists and a, a, a I guess he's, he's a psychologist who studies people's relationship to money. And he and I were talking and he was like, you know, people have this emotional connection with money that they don't even realize that they do. Even people who don't have a lot of money, they still have some emotional connection. And what they don't realize is that connection that you have is guiding how you make decisions in different parts of your life. But if you never realize or come to realization of what that relationship looks like, you're probably making a whole lot of decisions that aren't in your best interest. You just don't know. And so I tell people investing in the stock market, it'll start to bring the light. What does that relationship look like for you? Oh, yeah. Like my AP government teacher, Mr. Seltzer, this is, you know, it kind of ties along with the stock market, but it really, it really goes along with emotional versus logical based thinking mm -hmm. and, you know, reaction timing that my AP government teacher told me, you know, some parent sends him a nasty email and, you know, before he goes, you know, type in all the things and he's like, oh, you, yeah, you're not right. Like, get out of here. Like, it starts freaking out. He goes, you know, I'm going to walk away from my computer. I'll sleep on it. Tomorrow, I will, you know, answer the email because when you're when you're fired up like that, like you make decisions like that and you don't think you don't think all the way through. But like the stock market, you know, when something goes down, you're like, oh, I need to sell my stocks. Like I just lost. I lost three grand. But then, you, you know, you go to sleep, you wake up. It's like maybe I shouldn't have sold it. And that's where the real thinking of your brain starts to go like. Oh, like this makes sense. You know, this, you know, the, you know, I don't know, the oil industry is, you know, booming right now all of a sudden. So EVs are going to go down or what, you know, whatever it may be. But you know, at the end of the day, it all, it all kind of goes in the terms of, you know, how is your brain work? Like you were saying, how is your brain working in that relationship? And money is something that is very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts in that, especially in that sense, you know, getting winning and losing money is a very dangerous game. People love to win and really, really hate to lose when it comes to money. Absolutely. And that's why I always tell people, you know, you know, starting small when it comes to investing, like something that you won't miss. And, you know, I always kind of related to even when I was in college and I think about like, hey, if I went out to eat, you know, how much money would I spend? Because at the end of the day, I mean, especially if you, based on where my metabolism was when I was in college, you know, three hours later, that food's not going to matter anymore because <laughs> <I mean, laughs> I'm going to be hungry again. So I'm like, how much money would I spend if I went out to eat? And what if I use that and bought a stock at least, you know, a week from later? I would still have the stock. I would still own the stock. I would have something to show for that money that I spent. And it's a small enough number that, hey, if I lost it all, I wouldn't be devastated. I mean, it was, you know, 20, 30 bucks or whatever. Um, and I think that as you start to really start small and start to test out, hey, what's my relationship to money plus? Let me start learning how the stock market works because I always tell people, you'll learn a whole lot more once you actually get involved. Um, and once you start paying attention to things and as you get better, then you can start to graduate and add more to it because you, it'll make more sense to you. But I think you have to build up that tolerance of what are you willing to lose to gain what it is that you think is a potential. Yeah, you have to be, you know, comfortable with what's going to happen because you can go either way. You know, are you comfortable losing $50? three thousand dollars you're comfortable losing a million dollars whatever it may be you know i don't know what people's financial statuses are but you know it, it you have to be able to you know take the i love i love the saying you know take the yin yang of everything because that's when you can make a full judgment or opinion on something are you okay losing the fifty dollars are you okay making a hundred dollars everyone's going to be okay making a hundred dollars like whatever <laughs> maybe but are you okay taking the backlash you know all right fifty dollars is gone like 
it's not going to ruin my life or anything. I'm okay with it. But something else, I, you know, going off, going off the stock market topic, as a financial guy, I'm very interested to ask you this opinion. What is your feeling on cryptocurrency in today's, you know, what's going to happen with it? You know, I know the accounting, I'm sure that you've gotten a couple statements now with, you know, a cryptocurrency exchange thing rather than hasn't been a thing that companies are investing in the past 10 years. So what's your real opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a lot, a ton of opportunity for cryptocurrency. And I think you know, a lot of people are starting to see it where you have some major companies that are, you know, investing in cryptocurrency themselves because they see that there's potential there. Now, there is a ton of there are a ton of cryptocurrencies out there. So I always tell people it's just like anything else. I mean, when something is new and it's trendy, there will be a lot of copycats. Um, but one of the things that I, I realized with some research that I was looking at around like marketing and branding is typically the ones that are seen as like the, the kings or the top five players in any type of segment, those are the ones that usually have like staying and lasting power. Um, and so I think when it comes down to cryptocurrency, you know, the top player, I mean, definitely Bitcoin's a huge one. Um, I mean, it's one of the first in the, in the industry that people are familiar with, and it may not even be the very first crypto, but it's the first one that people are familiar with. So I think that there's a lot of potential for cryptocurrency, especially now with, you know, everybody working remotely and just how COVID has forced us to accept a, I guess you would say, accept a digital life style way, way more than we have in the past. So I think that cryptocurrency is definitely going to be more attractive to a lot more companies, especially as you start thinking about, you know, some of the laws and the restrictions for like, you know, I guess you say monetary funds and different countries trying to play games or make rules around controlling and, and whether it's inflating or deflating money. I think more people are going to be attracted to digital assets and cryptocurrencies more. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And the fact that like now these international companies say I have, oh no, I'm trying, like you were saying, I was trying to, you know, sell propellers to try and try, try and sell like $20 million, you know, $20 million deal for these propellers in Europe. You know, they use the euro, we use, you know, us dollars. Well, with cryptocurrency, it's just one thing. Like you could pay in Bitcoin now, which is where it really gets interesting nowadays. Cause I could take my phone somewhere, you know, maybe when it all becomes, you know, next five, 10 years, we're going to see, you're going to be able to pay with it. Like off your phone, just tap something, boom, you know, you pay for it. And that's what, what's cool about it. You could literally walk around with a hard drive, a cell phone and pay with anything in yeah. the entire, for anything in the entire world, which I think is really cool and that's where i think cryptocurrency's potential is really through the roof because if it's everyone can use it how are you going to regulate it there's going to be yeah. no no possible way that unless like the un would some would say something about it but that's so far off the radar you know there's way more important things that are happening in the world but that's so far off the radar that i could never see that happening at least in the next five to 10 years, you know, who knows? No one mm -hmm. even knows it's going to happen tomorrow. So yeah. like that, that's where, that's where it's really interesting to me to see how big this potential is. And that's the same thing with, uh, have you heard of like uh, NFTs? It's a really, really big topic right now. Yeah. I've heard of NFTs. Uh, now I haven't dove into it as deeply, but I've heard some people talking about it. So I think it's really interesting about, about NFTs. You know, I'm sure you've seen the whole trading card, like, you know, genre boom over the past, you know, year or two with everyone in quarantine, Pokemon cards going through the roof, like five, you could pay for a house with a first edition hollow base Charizard or whatever it is. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the NFTs are like, you know, virtual trading cards. And that's how I think of it. I mean, I'm sure that there's a way better way to explain it, but that's, you know, the bare minimum. So if I wanted to, you know, say Terrell, you wanted to make, you know, your own NFT, you could buy, you know, basically futures on your life. Like, am I 
which is really, really interesting because you weren't able to do that before. I know, you know, if you, if you know who Logan Paul is, who's, you know, great. You, first of all, genius. Might not seem like it, but he's really, really smart. He made his NFTs and basically how he explains that, are you going to take futures on Logan Paul? And people were like, oh yeah, like if he does something really good with his career, you know, the value will skyrocket. And that's what's like really cool about it is that, you know, before it's like something that you could hold in your hand, but now it's, you know, something digital that that's where everything's going to move to one day. And we won't be having this conversation through Zoom. You're going to be sitting with a hologram like right next to me. <laughs> and we're just going to be like having a normal conversation. That's where like technology is moving, you know, towards this, di- like you were saying, this digital revolution. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, that mindset is probably what's going to drive it more um, behind oh, yeah. like those NFTs is because what it does, it gives the individual person more control over like, you know, what's going on with their life. Because, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, the concept of NFTs is exactly what has been underlying the insurance industry, uh, the banking industry. Because I mean, even like I would say, if you went to go get a loan to buy a house or whatever, you got a mortgage. Simply what a mortgage is, is the bank is saying, I bet that you're going to be able to make enough money in the future to pay all this back. So I'm going to give you the money today to buy the house because I think your future is going to be bright enough for you to pay me back. I mean, and so it's just pretty much they're betting on your potential to make money in the future. Now they're, you know, they, they, they build in an interest rate to compensate themselves for that. But I think, you know, things like digital assets, cryptocurrencies, like NFTs, what it does, it allows individual people to start doing what insurance companies, what banks have been doing for years. And banks have been making billions betting on the future that people will make enough money to pay these loans back to where, individual people will now be able to say, hey, I think my future is going to be brighter than it is today. I'll let people buy into me today at a price to have access to, hey, where might I go tomorrow or where might I go in the future? And I think people will be attracted to doing that more and more. Um, Because like I said, it's something that banks have been doing for years. It's real. That's a really great analogy. And I didn't think about it that way, but that you're a hundred percent right with that reasoning. And that's really, that is really interesting to say that like, Hey, these banks have been doing it for, you know, hundreds of years at this point. And now, you know, people are kind of figuring it out. Like you can take futures on me if I, you know, maybe I make a billion dollars, you know, my NFT is going to go through the roof or whatever it may be so you know something else i want to touch on Charlie, is that you know you're a podcaster too the lifestyle of a podcaster <laughs> what what are, what are your couple i know you have two podcasts right what are those about uh, yeah so the first one is called that i started with was called uh business talk library and that one i'm interviewing you know founders i'm interviewing ceos executives um we've also had a couple um, college uh, professors and doctors in different topics of research related to business. And we talk about, you know, their story, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we have on, we talk about, hey, what was it like, you know, founding your business? What was that journey really like? Because a lot of people see the Instagram version of entrepreneurship, but I like to have the real conversation about it. Um, and so we, we dive into a lot of that. And then every episode, um, I always end with, hey, what are two tips that you would share with other business owners? Um, because I think we learn a lot of value from each other. So that show, we started in April of 2020. And so from April to December of 2020, we filmed what, 232 episodes. Um, and oh it was God. just- <laughs> Holy it crap. Was- I'm slacking. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, dude, that's awesome though. That's uh, mm-hmm. hey, that's the I, that's the entrepreneurship grind right there. Two hundred episodes <laughs> in what seven months? Whew. But but anyway, dude, that's awesome. Like talking with people, that's what I I kind of like as well because 
like you were saying, you know, no, it's not like the Instagram story that everyone sees of me flexing <laughs> with, you know, dude, go check out my new t-shirt brand or wh- whatever it may be. You know, that's mm. just one example, but it's really interesting to see like what's behind the end product, because in today's society, everyone loves seeing the end product, like the, like YouTube videos and all that. They love seeing what did they do with, you know, this money, how, like, why is this, Hmm, how I, I'm trying to think of it not like myself because I try and think of it like why does this work like what makes this successful and whatever maybe but people nowadays just like like seeing it and like being entertained and you know whatever they don't really care what goes into it but that's a different it's cool to see the other perspective of it and that's what you're doing on your show yeah absolutely you know I, I think of it this way I mean it's like you know what if you had the opportunity to you know go back in time and talk to, you know, Steve Jobs before everybody knew what Apple was, or you had a chance to talk to Jeff Bezos when he was, you know, when he was just doing maybe, you know, $50,000 in sales. Like if you had the chance to talk to him then, you know, it's extremely valuable. Cause I mean, people would pay huge dollars to go back and hear, Hey, what was he thinking back then? And how did he get where he got? And so it's always good, I think, to hear, I call it the, you know, the real side of entrepreneurship and the story behind the story. Um, and then the other show that I do is, um, is one I do with my wife. She, she's, her background is accounting and finance as well. And so we do a show called Finance and Accounting and where we break down finance and accounting topics for business owners. Now, one of the areas I, a lot of my clients are in like kind of the restaurant industry. So, you know, a lot of times they know their recipes, they know how to run their business, but they don't understand the finance side. And you know what, most accountants aren't trying to break it down so they understand it. So on that show, we talk about different topics like, hey, if you're gonna go to a bank and get a loan, here's what you need to be prepared for, or here's how you should set things up so that you have that discussion and you're more likely to actually get the loan. Or, hey, here are things you need, numbers you need to watch. And then my wife is fluent in four languages. So one of those is Spanish. Wow. And so she does the business talk library in Spanish um, um, and, and really serving a lot of Latin America and then the Spanish speaking business owners in the U.S. Wow. Four language. That's, <laughs> uh, that's impressive to say at least. I know you ended with it, but what, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. But no, I, I love, I love that you're trying to, a lot of people when they make it, they kind of like, don't try and give back with, you know, their skill. Like your skill is obviously, and your wife is in accounting and finance. This is something that, you know, you know, all about it. This is what, you know, I devoted my time for. So now I'm, you know, no one ever masters anything. So I don't want to call anyone a master or whatever it may be, but you, you've gotten insanely good at your craft and now you're able to explain it in ways that, you know, people like me can understand. And that's the thing, like, I'm sure that the things that you talk about are things that you learned in like college and, you know, different topics that, you know, brought up in some textbook or whatever it may be that people just honestly don't want to read and but that's what's great about a podcast because you can listen and do something else at the same same time and that's Mm -hmm. what's that's what's really cool about this medium of you know medium of media if that i if that's if that's what it is uh, (laughs) medium right yeah whatever whatever it is but um it's a it's a cool medium to especially with things like that because say i'm a you know i'm a restaurant owner i can look at my accounting statement while you're talking to me, I'm like, oh, like, oh, I should be looking at, you know, what's my revenue compared to my expenses? And I'm, I, I know the very bare minimum of accounting, by the way, so bear <laughs> with me. But, but anyway, you know, it, that, that's awesome. That it's a way to kind of apply, apply what you did for so long and what you're doing into other people's lives so that they can that you can help them though. It might not be direct. It's an indirect form of, you know, assistance, but at least it's helping someone get more knowledgeable of the topic that they probably have been looking over for how forever, how, or who knows how long. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it really does help a lot of people sometimes just to hear, 
the thought process because for me that was one of those things that changed it for me is you know the environments that you put yourself in you know they tend to have certain conversations happen in, in places that don't like growing up um no one in my family had an accounting and finance background so i was never in the environment where we were talking about money and how to manage the finance side of a business so doing the podcast allowed us hey people know that when they come to the finance and accounting show podcast that's an environment where we're going to be talking about topics where you may not hear that where you know from where they're from i mean if you're a restaurant owner no one in your family is talking about that type of stuff but you can come to that show and be in the environment of you know money being discussed in a way that relates to business to where it will start to spark ideas that you didn't think about because you're hearing another story or you're hearing us talk about, hey, another business that had this situation and we explain it and people are like, oh, you know what? I had a situation like that. That's how I fix it. Or, hey, maybe that helped me think about this over here. And I think by people being able to just, it's almost like you're jumping into the middle of a conversation and I, I, as you said, that's what I love about podcasts is people get to jump in and hear those nuggets in conversations that had it not been for a podcast, the listeners for your show would have never heard this conversation between you and I. Yeah, you would have had to, you know, go talk to someone directly and, you know, maybe... Uh, I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but you have to talk to someone directly, basically. Mm -hmm. And with podcasts, you can listen to pretty much anyone talk. You can listen to me, listen to Terrell, whoever it may be that have some kind of better, I'm not saying that I'm a, you know, God or anything about wisdom because <laughs> no one is, but you know, at the end of the day, I might know something that you are not aware of and haven't done a lot of research. And, you know, maybe I spark it, maybe you spark something in the accounting and finance, you know, podcast whatever it may be that these podcasts are able to teach people something in a different way that they haven't really been taught to before than watching a video or whatever it may be. But Charles, before we go on with the rest of our night, got to ask you the question that I ask all the guests here. It's a classic. What is one piece of wisdom that you want to pass on to the listeners? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, a lot of people I think get stuck trying to figure out what to do next. And one of those conversations that my wife and I were having, even as we navigate different things in the business is that part of that reason is people are trying to figure out what the road is going to look like without having to actually go down the road. And so one of the things that I tell her is like, hey, you know what, being in business or just trying to, you know, do something new, there's going to be a process of learning. So it's like, don't be afraid to travel down a new road or be, think that you have to know what's going to happen before it happens. It's like, no, travel down the road with the mindset that, hey, I'm going to learn as I go. And as you travel down that road, the path or what needs to come next will become clearer as you start making progress down the road. Because I talk to people all the time that want to start a business and they're like, well, I just don't know what to start. And I'm like, start something and start to learn along the way because you'll never start a business or you'll never choose a career path. You'll never choose a major if you're just sitting and waiting for the right thing to just hit you. It's like start taking steps and keep your eyes and your ears open to learn as you go and the path will get clearer and clearer as you go stop waiting for perfection it's never going to happen go do what is on your mind right now it's probably your best shot about doing something go with that gut feeling stop overthinking it guys that's it for another episode of the ronan bell show terrell thank you so much for coming on the show today man absolutely man thanks for having me is there anything that you want to plug before we go on um, I will say people that are interested in checking out the podcast um, that we do, um, they can go over to businesstalklibrary.com. And when they go to businesstalklibrary.com, they'll see all the great podcasts that we're doing in the business, the finance and accounting and podcasts that we're doing in Spanish. That's awesome. Pro, again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Guys, 
that's a wrap for another episode of the Running Bell Show. I think I said that twice, but you know, who cares? Um, guys, I hope you have a great rest of your day getting through whatever you're getting through. And as always, y'all just keep on keeping on.